All right, folks, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so um, I'm Melissa Fisher Isaacs. I'm the Information Services Coordinator here at the Lawrence Public Library. And we're thrilled to welcome you here. Um, so we're excited to be partnering with um, our friends at the League of Women Voters of Lawrence Douglas County um, and Humanities Kansas um, to bring you this uh, four part series on Civic Engagement 101. Um, our goal with this series is to bring you unbiased, nonpartisan information about issues that are going to be on the November ballot um, and to help you understand your rights as a voter. Um, so this session um, is being streamed over Zoom. Um, it will be recorded and um, available on the library's YouTube channel uh, probably towards the end of this week. Um, there are three more sessions coming up in this series. Um, September 27th, we will have a loud light here and they will be talking about uh, knowing your votes as a right, uh, your <laughs> rights as a voter. Um, October 11th, Virgil Dean will be presenting uh, We the People of Kansas, the story of Kansas's founding documents, 1820 to 2022. Um, that's gonna be kind of a history and evolution of the Kansas constitution. Um, and then on October 25th, Hannes Zacharias um, will be presenting uh, city and county governments in Kansas, what they do um, and how they are financed. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm excited to introduce Amy Castle. Um, Amy has spent most of her career as a litigator in downtown Kansas City and has served as a law clerk for three federal judges. She is now a professor of law and business at the University of Kansas. Shortly after joining her alma mater, Amy launched the university's American Civil Liberties Union student group, of which she's now the advisor. Happy to turn it over to Amy. Oh, you wanna, hold on. Little technical stuff here. There we go. Okay. Um, hold on, guys and gals and days. There we go. All right, um, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Amy Castle, and I teach at the law school, the business school. I also teach constitutional law um, at the poli sci department. So uh, hopefully I'm qualified to be up here speaking to you today about what's coming up on the November ballot. So what is on the ballot this November? Well, let's start with who, who are some of the candidates we'll be voting for, right? So we've got our governor's race, governor, lieutenant governor. We have our incumbent, Governor Kelly, uh, and Derek Schmidt will be running against Governor Kelly. We have an attorney general, general's race. Uh, and in that race, we've got Chris Mann versus Chris Kobach. Uh, we've got a Secretary of State race. In that race, we've got incumbent Scott Schwab, sorry, and uh, Gina Repass. And then we have, uh, we will be voting on the insurance commissioner. I did not commit the names to my memory, but there is a Democrat and there is a Republican uh, running for insurance commissioner. We also have a Senate seat that we will be voting on. Jerry Moran uh, is running in the uh, Democratic uh, 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 person running against Jerry uh, is Mark Holland. And we also have, if you live in Douglas County, um, we have uh, house seat number one and house seat number two, depending on where you live. So you will be voting on your representative to send to Congress, right, of your area. Now, if you didn't follow the, the maps and the redistricting, I thought I would just do a basic 101. If your head sort of spun, when you were in District 2 and now all of a sudden you're in District 1, which is actually what happened to me. So what happened, this is the former map, right? This is what the map looked like for the decade before. District 1, right, is that all that rural area, all of the, the border to Colorado. And then Lawrence was in District 2, right? So after the redistricting happened, so there, there's, a, there's just a, a line drawing of District 2, right? So what happened after uh, redistricting occurred is they literally took Lawrence, scooped it out, and put it in the first district. So if you live in the city of Lawrence, you have the same representative as all of, there we go, you have the same representative of all those rural folks, right? Uh, if you live in Southern Douglas County or Western Douglas County, right, Baldwin or Eudora, you're still in District 2. And so if you're in District 1, 
um, like I am. And the incumbent is Tracy Mann, and uh, Jimmy Beard is running against uh, Representative Mann. If you're in District 2, Jake LaTurner is the current uh, representative, and Patrick Schmidt is the person who's running against Jake LaTurner. So that's just um, a little bit about uh, the, the mapping, right? So that's where we find ourselves. Um, so if you're in the city proper, you're in District 1. If you're on the outskirts of the city, you're in District 2, just like you were. Um, state Senate, we do not have any state Senate races on the November ballot. Um, all the state senators will come up for re-election in two years, in 2024. Uh, all of the state representatives are on the ballot, um, all 125. So you find your whoever your representative is, um, and you can figure out who you want to vote for. Uh, we've also got some positions that we'll be voting on for the state board of education and then finally um, district one for douglas county commission is up for re-election uh, patrick kelly is the incumbent um, who is who is running against justin Spees. okay so that's who's running all right now let's get to why you're actually here let's talk about these two proposed state constitutional amendments that you'll be voting on November 8th. So first of all, basic constitutional law 101, everybody knows we have a federal constitution, right? But some people don't realize every state has their own constitution. So we have a state constitution. Uh, it was ratified in um, 1861, and it has been amended 98 times. Our United States Constitution has been amended 27 times. Kansas Constitution, 98 times. So that's what's up on, for, uh, on the ballot, similar to August, right? That was also a proposed state constitutional amendment that would have said that a woman doesn't have a state constitutional right to access abortion care. And so, um, that, so we've been down this road. Am I good? Oh, am I in the wrong kind of view? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we've been down this road recently, um, and here we are again. So this time there are two uh, proposed state constitutional amendments. So let's talk about um, both of them. Talk about one first, then the other, and then we're going to break the second one down. So the first proposed state constitutional amendment is titled the legislative veto or suspension of executive agency regulations amendment that's what it's actually called and so at the end of the day what this vote a vote yes on this amendment would give the state legislature power to revoke or suspend rules and regulations that are passed by our state executive agencies all right and so i'm going to tell you how i got here with this conclusion as to what the consequence of voting uh, a yes on this amendment so here's the text i am not going to take your precious time and read every word of it but i can tell you it's really really confusing what i have done is i paraphrased it okay so this is a paraphrase of the amendment 
uh, legislative oversight of administrative rules and regulations. When an agency within the executive branch of gov government adopts rules or regulations, the legislature may revoke or suspend any such regulations, rules and regulations upon a simple majority vote of legislators. Now, further paraphrasing, paraphrasing what the amendment would do, it would give the state legislature power to revoke or suspend agency rules by a simple majority vote and the governor, the governor is never involved. The governor doesn't get a veto. So let me explain that. How, if, if this passed, how would it change existing law? How, how do things work now? Well, basic um, black letter law, right? We have this concept, this notion of separation of powers, right? We like to, we, we divide our powers between our three branches of government and we hope to have checks and balances right in between the three. Make sure one branch of government doesn't get too powerful. So legislature passes the laws, executive branch enforces the law, the judiciary interprets the laws. Now, where do executive agencies in under, uh, on, on, on separation of powers? State executive, executive agencies are under the, the the governor, okay, are under the governor. The governor uh, has, uh, uh, they're part of the executive branch. We have 13 proper uh, state executive agencies in Kansas. Um, and then there are some other agencies that aren't quite as official, but 13 official ones. And so I've got a, some logos of just a few examples, right? The Kansas Department of Revenue, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, uh, the Kansas Department of uh, Agriculture. Those are administrative agencies. Now, those agencies, in doing their job, they pass rules and regulations that govern our conduct, that govern conduct of, of businesses. Um, and so what this... So what I'd like to do is I want to, when I say that passing this amendment would take power away from the executive branch, those executive agencies, and Governor Kelly, and give that to the legislature, what I want to do is I want to sort of do it by way of example. What kind of regulations are we talking about, and why do we care if 51% of our legislature wants to revoke or suspend a regulation? Sounds pretty dry and boring. Let's take the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, right? The Kansas Department of Health and Environment is tasked with, their purpose is to keep us healthy and to keep us safe, right? So let's say the Kansas Department of Health and Environment passes a regulation that either prohibits or limits the dumping of toxic chemicals into our water streams, creeks, lakes, rivers, okay? So Kansas Department of Health and Environment says, we think this is good to protect the health and safety of Kansans, right? By not dumping toxic chemicals into our waterways. Now, if the if the if if the um, if the legislature let's okay, so Kansas Department of Health and Environment passes the regulation. Let's say fifty-one percent or a majority of our legislators currently in Topeka don't like that regulation. Well, what 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 can they do about it as the law stands right now they can revoke or suspend that regulation but they have to do it by passing a law they have to do it just like they do everything else they have to pass a law so what does that take right well you have to have a legislator who introduces a bill to revoke or suspend that regulation right then the bill has to pass 51% of, of the legislature, right? 51% of the House, 51% of the Senate. Then, just as any other bill, that bill then goes to the governor's desk for the governor's signature. Now, if the governor vetoes a bill, right? It goes back to the legislature, and the only way that the legislature can pass a bill that the governor has vetoed is by a supermajority, right? Two thirds. So the only way um, right now that uh, that um, 
uh, that the legislature can revoke our anti our pollution law is they have to have two thirds majority right because Governor Kelly would obviously if she were governor she would veto that right so it would require a super majority so that's how it stands now. That's how an agency rule or regulation can be revoked by the legislature. It basically takes a two third majority. This amendment would take those final steps completely out of the equation and the governor, uh, whoever is elected would have uh, no veto power um, when it comes to the legislature wanting to revoke or suspend these agency rules and regulations. If the amendment passes, if the legislature doesn't like a regulation, then you have a legislator who introduces a bill, let's revoke that, that anti-pollution regulation. And then all that is required is 51% of our state legislators. Never goes to the governor, doesn't require a super majority, 51%. So we are handing, if the amendment passes, we are handing power from the executive branch, right, the governor and those executive agencies, and giving power to our state legislators. So in that case, 51% uh, could vote, we don't like that anti-pollution regulation and we're going to rescind it or revoke it, and they can do it with 51% if the amendment passes. So the amendment would give uh, the state legislature power to revoke or suspend agency regulations by a simple majority, thereby taking away the governor's veto power in that circumstance, in that situation. So I've got little yes votes, no votes here. Um, and so a yes vote uh, would allow the state legislature to pass laws by a simple majority vote to revoke or suspend regulations adopted by executive agencies. A no vote opposes the constitutional amendment, thereby maintaining that the legislature must pass, to, pass a law to revoke or suspend agency regulations, um, and they would need a veto-proof majority to, to, to do that. All right, is your head spinning yet? All right, okay, now let's talk about the second amendment the sheriff amendment. And so this one is called county sheriff election and recall amendment. And what this amendment will do if it's passed, it, it will have, it will potentially change the way that we elect sheriffs and the way we remove sheriffs, the way we remove sheriffs who are behaving badly, right? So let's talk, let's, let's break it down. Okay. So let's talk first um, about the election of sheriffs and what this amendment will do. This is the text. You can find this on Ballotpedia, the texts of all the amendments. So this is the actual text um, of, the, of the part of the amendment that deals with how we elect our sheriff. Now, breaking it down, that amendment says, each county shall elect a sheriff, and that subsection A does not apply to Riley County. So why is that? So under Kansas law, city and county governments can consolidate. If they think they can save money, be more efficient, they can consolidate. And under Kansas state law, um, well, let me say this, only one of our 105 counties, Riley County, has consolidated um, its, its, its county and city, city government. Uh, Riley County did that back in 1974, a long, long time ago. So, um, so here's the deal though. This is what's kind of confusing and I hope, I hope that to make it understanding. If you've heard of this amendment, okay, the amendment requires that we elect sheriffs, but wait a minute, we already elect sheriffs in all 104 of our counties except for Riley County. So why do we even need this, right? Basically what the amendment would do, it would require going forward that um, all sheriffs be elected. So if the amendment passes, what, what effect might that have in the future? Well, where it comes up is if a county and city decide that they want to consolidate in the future, which they can do under Kansas state law, let's say Douglas County wants to consolidate city and county governments completely. 
Well, state law provides that in a consolidated government, a, a law enforcement agency board is created, people, right? And they choose a police director. Those, though, the agency board chooses a police director. And so what that means is that um, if that means that there is no elected law enforcement person in a consolidated government, the highest law enforcement person official, right, is appointed by a board not elected by the people. And so going forward, um, if the proposed at the end of the day, when we're talking about election of sheriffs, the proposed amendment would require the election of sheriffs, which we all do right now, but if, if, if a county and city decided to consolidate, this proposed amendment would prohibit that appointment of a police director as the highest law enforcement person in the area, right? And, and would require that there be a county elected sheriff, a sheriff who um, answers to voters and not a board. <clears throat> okay, so that's the election part of the sheriff amendment. Now let's turn to the removal of sheriffs. Um, and so this, again, the text of the amendment, um, uh, I'm not gonna read it, but the paraphrase is, county officials can be removed from office. We kind of already know that. If you're, if you're engaged in misconduct, you can get kicked out of office, right? Um, but here's, here's where uh, the amendment, uh, or the proposed amendment gets a little bit more nuanced. So the, the, the uh, amendments would say, a county sheriff may be involuntarily removed from office only by a recall election of the voters or a writ of quo warranto, which is a stupid legal term. I learned it in law school. I never used it myself in practice, so I kind of had to brush up on my Latin, uh, by quo warranto uh, initiated by the attorney general. Okay, so that's what the uh, amendment, that's how it reads. And at the end of the day, the proposed amendment would take power from our, all local district attorneys across the state to initiate an investigation to a sheriff's misconduct and place that power to initiate an investigation solely in the hands of the attorney general. So, what does our, so if this amendment passes, how would this change things? How would this change what the current law is? Well, with respect to a voter recall, if voters think that their sheriff is behaving badly, this amendment has no effect. Voters can recall their sheriffs, okay? So this amendment doesn't, doesn't change that at all. So if you're not happy with what your sheriff is doing, or you think your sheriff's engaging in shenanigans. You can go collect signatures from your friends. If you get 40% of the number of voters who voted in the last election, then you can present your petition to Jamie Shue at the elections office and there'll be an election. And if 51% of the voters believe the sheriff should be ousted, the sheriff's gonna be removed from office. So the amendment does not change that at all. We can do that now. We'll be able to do that if the amendment passes. Let's talk about this, this investigation, this, this legal proceeding that, um, that uh, can be filed uh, if another official believes that the sheriff has engaged in some sort of misconduct. So a county sheriff can be involuntary, involuntarily removed from office only by a voter recall we just covered that, right? Or a writ of quo warranto initiated by the attorney general. So a quo warranto, it's just a proceeding um, where a, a, another official says, hey, we need to investigate another person in office, right? And, and determine whether they have engaged in some kind of misconduct. So this is a legal proceeding um, that initiates an investigation into a, a county official. In this case, we're talking about sheriffs. Um, and at the end of the day, what I think is important to know 
that as I'm talking about who gets to initiate an investigation, this is a court proceeding, okay? At the end of the day, it's going to be a judge determining if the sheriff engaged in misconduct, if the sheriff should be removed from office. So whoever initiates the investigation, they don't get to make the decision whether to remove the sheriff, right? A judge in a court of law is going to do that after gathering facts from an investigation. So under current law, or under our current state law, if a either a local district attorney or the state attorney general believes that a sheriff has gone rogue, maybe tampering with evidence, hiding evidence, we have an awesome sheriff here. I don't think that ever is going to happen in Douglas County. But if, if an, a public official believes that, I'm sorry, if a district attorney or the attorney general believe that the sheriff has engaged in misconduct, at this moment, current state of the law, both the district attorney and the state attorney uh, and, the, and the attorney general can initiate that investigation. Um, and we know uh, in, in currently, right now, that would be Suzanne Valdez, right, who's our Douglas County District Attorney, and Derek Schmidt, who is the current um, Kansas Attorney General. So as it stands, um, let's say, and I'm using this just as an example, let's say a local district attorney uh, believes that um, a sheriff has hid or tampered with evidence, okay? And so they, they in, a, in a criminal case. And so that district attorney would like an investigation. Well, under the current law, and uh, the attorney general, I'm sorry, the district attorney can file one of these legal proceedings and initiate that investigation, make sure that the sheriff didn't tamper with evidence. What the amendment will do is, well, actually, we know Derek Schmidt is not going to be attorney general because he's running for governor. So our attorney general is either going to be Chris Kobach or Chris Mann. OK, so so that's going to be our attorney general. Uh, we're going to have Suzanne Valdez for uh, another couple of years. Uh, so right now, both offices can initiate this investigation. This amendment would take local district attorneys completely out of the equation. Local district attorneys would have no power to file a legal proceeding to initiate an investigation against a sheriff who is behaving badly. And, you know, it kind of it, it sort of cuts both ways. But, you know, oftentimes it's the, the local district attorney who's going to know whether the sheriff is, you know, doing bad things and probably not the attorney general who sits in Topeka most days. Right. So um, and 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 and. You know, if a if a local district attorney believes that a sheriff is engaged in misconduct, they're probably not. They're going to probably ask another district attorney's office, right, to help them out, right? The 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 appearance of 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 of, of you know being fair. But the point is, is this amendment would take all local district attorneys, all 105, completely out of the equation, so that only the attorney general will have the legal power to initiate an investigation uh, into a sheriff. So at the end of the day, the proposed uh, amendment uh, would take power from all 105 local district attorneys and, and give that power solely to the attorney general. The attorney general already has the power. They both do, right? They concurrently have that power. This amendment would take the DA out of the equation, and that power would rest solely with whoever is in office, right, which is going to be either Chris Kobach or Chris Mann. So a vote yes would, first of all, require counties to elect their sheriffs uh, and would take power away from local district attorneys to file this legal proceeding to initiate uh, an investigation into a sheriff and give that power solely to the attorney general. A no vote just keeps the status quo. Uh, a no vote would, would mean that counties, including cons consolidated governments, are not required to elect a sheriff. So if a county wanted to consolidate, they could, they could appoint a police director <clears throat> if the amendment does not pass. Um, and then 
A vote no retains the power, the status quo um, that local district attorneys, in addition to the state attorney general in Topeka, um, have the power to initiate an investigation um, into a sheriff. All right, those are the amendments. Clear as mud. I hope it's making a little bit of sense. I think we're going to do questions at the end. Okay. Because we're on Zoom and I got to take the microphone around. All right, so those are the two uh, constitutional amendments. Does anybody want to talk about judges, maybe? Okay. All right, so let's talk about our judges and retention elections and how how we do it in Kansas. Um, and, and we're not alone. Many, many, many states do the same system that we do. Um, it's actually called the Missouri Plan. So what we're talking about when we're talking about retention of judges, what's going to be on the ballot, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, are going to be names of judges who are justices who are on the Kansas Supreme Court and the Kansas Court of Appeals. Okay. Every, every case starts at a trial court level, right? Somebody has to file something, file a lawsuit. Well, the loser of the trial court level always gets a right to appeal. In Kansas, that appeal is going to go up to the Kansas Supreme Court. All right, if the loser at the appellate court is not happy, then they can further appeal to the Kansas Supreme Court. So the judges on the ballot are judges who are Kansas State Supreme Court justices and Kansas Court of Appeals judges. There are some local judges, depending on local rules. I'm not even going to get into that. I just want to talk about the state uh, judges, the um, state Supreme Court and Kansas Court of Appeals. So how, how, are, those, how are those judges uh, determined? Well, when there's a vacancy on the bench, Supreme Court, Kansas Court of Appeals, when there's a vacancy, then the governor, whoever is the governor, appoints a person to fill that vacancy. There's a little bit of a process. Some people tell the governor potential names, but at the end of the day, it is absolutely up to the governor who to appoint as a Supreme Court or Court of Appeals justice. And so we have a lot of judges up for retention, as you'll see on your ballot. And the reason is because when a judge is appointed by the governor, that very next election cycle, they have to they have to run for retention. They are up. They have to to face the voters. And retention means yes, we're going to keep the judges. Not retaining means we're going to give them the boot. Right? We're going to kick them out. So whenever a judge or a justice is appointed by the governor, that very very next election cycle, they are on the ballot. And then every six years thereafter they face retention. So process, vacancy on the bench, governor appoints the state Supreme Court justice or Kansas Court of Appeal judge. Within that next year, that judge has to go up for retention. That judge is going to be on the ballot. Then every six years, uh, they come up for retention again. Uh, and so let's talk about our Kansas Supreme Court. Here is our Kansas Supreme Court. We have seven justices on our Kansas Supreme Court. Um, and these are the, the, the seven justices. Uh, Chief Judge uh, Lockhart, um, I think she was appointed chief a couple of years ago. So these are our seven current Supreme Court justices. Now, um, yeah, okay, sorry. Now let's talk about this situation where a judge who is appointed immediately the very next election cycle has to go up for retention. Um, well, three of the seven Kansas Supreme Court justices have been were appointed in 2020 by Governor Kelly. So we have three baby judges, new judges, who are up for retention election. Three of them are simply because it's their first election they're facing after being appointed by Governor Kelly to the Kansas Supreme Court. What about those who might be facing their six-year retention election? There are three of them. 
All right, uh, Judge uh, Justice Stiegel, Justice Biles, and Justice Lucker. So they're all facing their just regular, normal, typical six-year retention elections. That's why we have six of the seven Supreme Court justices of our state on the ballot up for retention. Jamie, she was going to have a good old time with all the lists of all these names. There's a lot of judges because we haven't even gotten to the Kansas Court of Appeals yet. So, um, so six of the seven Kansas State Supreme Court justices are up for retention. What does that mean? Well, that means that if those judges are not retained, whoever wins the governor's race will get to pick seven, sorry, six new state Supreme Court justices. So it's either going to be Governor Kelly or it's going to be Derek Schmidt. And, um, you know, nobody needs a crystal ball to, 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 to guess the type of judges that Derek Schmidt might like. Um, in fact, the, the Kansas Supreme Court case that set off the whole constitutional amendment thing, right? You might have heard um, Hodes is the name. Some people pronounce it Hodes. It's not. It's Hodes. Um, Hodes and Nassar was the name of the 2019 case where the Kansas Supreme Court held that a woman has a state constitutional right to access abortion care. Well, that was Dr. Hodes and Dr. Nassar versus Derek Schmidt. Derek Schmidt argued in that case that women should not have a right to access abortion care. So, like I say, you don't need a crystal ball to know what kind of judges uh, Derek Schmidt might want on the Kansas Supreme Court. What about um, our Kansas Court of Appeals? They don't get nearly the fanfare um, because at the end of the day, the, the Supreme Court has the last word, okay? But these Kansas Courts of Appeal judges are still very important in our system. We have, we have 14 Kansas, Supre Kansas Court of Appeals judges, okay? And they have the same retention rules up for retention after they're appointed retention every six years. Out of the, the 14, there are seven Kansas Court of Appeals justices up for retention. So again, what does that mean? Well, whoever is elected governor gets to choose those seven Kansas Court of Appeals justices. It will be within their power to, to choose. If, if the judges, if it's a, a yes vote to retain, the, those 13 judges that I just talked about, the six from the Kansas Supreme Court, the seven from the Kansas Court of Appeals, they stay status quo, right? But if, if, they are, if, the, if the vote is no to not retain these judges, to vote the bastards out, right? Well, then the governor, whoever gets elected as governor, has the, um, gets to pick gets to choose who those justices are gonna be. So a yes vote <laughs> retains our state court judges. A no vote uh, removes our whatever state court judge you're voting for, you'll get to vote for each one, um, which will permit the next governor uh, to choose six Kansas Supreme Court justices and seven Kansas Court of Appeals judges. So there you go vote November 8th, right? Don't care which way you vote, but you should get out there and vote. Uh, make sure you're registered. Make sure your family and friends are registered. Uh, get registered by October 18th. Early voting begins the next day, um, October 19th. Um, and the rules say you have until November 1st to request a mail-in ballot. Do not wait till November 1st to request your mail-in ballot, okay? Do that way early if you like the convenience of being able to, to vote by mail. That's my presentation. I, I do hope you found it helpful. I hope I didn't just make you all more confused um, than uh, how you started. Let me, I'm gonna stop my share. And, I might need your help because I, I, I'm, I'll do the law stuff. You do the <laughs> Perfect.
So, um, so for the folks who are uh, joining us via Zoom, um, if you have a question, you'll need to ask it into the microphone. Um, so, you mean the folks who are here need to ask it into the microphone? Okay. Does anybody have any questions that I probably can't answer? Hi. Thanks for that information. What sort of authority does the sheriff have over elections in the county, and does it depend on the county? So I, um, that is not something I've dug in on, and I know that that's an issue. I, I mean, I know um, that in some counties there is um, disagreement on how much power the sheriff has over elections. Uh, elections actually, the, the running elections belongs with the Secretary of State. Um, so, and I don't mean to, Sheriff, is, am I, I, you probably actually know that, here, hold on. Hi, J.R. Brister. The sheriff can only investigate crimes that violate statute, and they can only, they can, they can open investigation for any reason, as we've seen. But they can they can, they have to shut their investigation down once they realize they have no evidence as we will see so the sheriff ha while we know of one that is grandstanding currently on this issue your sheriff believes that the elections belong with the secretary of state and jamie Shu. but if there is a crime that occurs during the election then we and we either are notified or need to investigate it then we will so i hope that answers Thank you very much for that clarification. Remind me of the of the, the term is a quo warranto. Yeah. So if if it that passes and the dispute actually goes to a judge, is that going to be a jury trial? Or how does the trial work? I I actually don't know, but I have a feeling it's not. I have a feeling it's an it's what we call an equitable remedy where a judge makes that decision and not a jury. I can't imagine that that kind of proceeding would go to a jury. Usually we say that's, that's uh, an equitable uh, relief, right? And so in equity, judges make the decisions, not juries. Um, my question really has to do with the uh, retention of judges. And traditionally, most people do not know who any of them are or what, how any of them voted on anything. So um, it seems to me, how do we as citizens make sure that people are aware that this is really a pretty significant retention segment, right? And so um, people need to, to vote. I second that. And, um, you know, you're right. Oftentimes when we uh, are voting on retention of judges, we just go, yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. Right. Um, so we have to get the word out. You know, I am sort of a prolific letter to the editor writer. So I'll be I've written on the amendment a couple of times and I'll also be writing on retention of judges to hopefully just get the word out that if 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 this is what happens, if if we don't vote or if we you know what happens if we retain or not so i appreciate your comments well i i may i don't know but anyway my question is on the amendments uh the ones that we voted on in august we knew from whence they came and i'm curious like these two amendments where on earth would they start and who would even come up with such a thing your kansas state legislature <laughs> um, but i will tell you both amendments are supported by derek schmidt my question is on the first amendment that you talked about so the legislature can pick any rule no matter how big or how small and then i guess this is a question of affirmation they also have no requirements to come up with an alternative or, okay, we just threw a big monkey wrench into the works, but hey, now you go figure that out. We just told you we didn't like it. 
And, and the amendment says specifically that the legislature will have the power to revoke or suspend by a simple majority, but it's, there is no requirement, but you got to fix what you rescinded or, right, yeah, so there's, no, there's nothing like that. They can just, they don't like a regulation, then they can rescind it. So um, my question and comment, mostly first comment, uh, this, this regulation, um, these regulations can be totally removed and generally a regulated entity has a public hearing when regulation is set up. So daycare providers, restaurant owners for food safety, um, actually abortion providers, all of these regulations are reviewed by the regulated entity and the regulated entity has a way to input their concerns or their issues. Can't do away with the regulation, but they may be able to modify it. With this situation, that takes all of the regulated entities out of the situation. It also can do away with food safety regulations, abortion regulations, whatever the case may be. And the Kansas Department of Health and Environment does regulate the abortion industry. And so on the environment side, that also means feedlots. That means, um, just like you said, the toxic waste situations. It means air quality. It means water safety, water quality, all of the regulations that, and it, it also means daycare providers, and the list is long. And this is a very, very, very concerning amendment. And it's a power grab. I appreciate your comments. Yeah, and if you think about it, um, you know, like, like you mentioned, you know, many of these rules and regulations go through a pretty rigorous process right before they're passed. Um, and also those agencies, they're kind of the experts in those fields, right? You're gonna hand over to 51% of our state legislators the power to, yeah, yeah, who might not, yeah. So I appreciate your comments. Did I see? Okay, I'm gonna get over to the other side of the room here and then I'll make my way back. Thank you. Um, about retention of the Kansas Supreme Court judges. There are seven, and what I think I know is that six of them were responsible for voting for um, abortion rights for women. Who was the seventh that dissented? And actually, I, I want to clarify that because that's actually not completely accurate. So the question is, out of the... Um, six judges up for retention in the Kansas Supreme Court, how did they vote in that Kansas Supreme Court decision? Not all of them were there, not all of them were appointed. So here's the way it breaks down. Remember, we have three new Kansas Supreme Court justices. They were not on the bench in 2019. They did not have a part in the Hodes decision. Footnote in that, put a pin in it, as Rachel says, I'll come back to that. So, um, uh, Justice Biles and Justice Lucker joined the opinion that found that women have a constitutional right to abortion. So they were pro-choice in that opinion. In fact, Justice Biles felt so strongly, he wrote what we call a concurring opinion, okay? That's saying, I agree with the majority, but I'm gonna explain even better why I believe that a woman has a constitutional right to access to abortion care. The only dissenter in the Hodes decision is Caleb Stiegel, and he is up for retention. Um, so he dissented, he said, no, uh, uh, women don't have a, a, a constitutional right to access abortion care. So Justice Stiegel is one of the six up for retention. So two are, we know, are <clears throat> pro-choice. Uh, one we know is not. Uh, and so what about those other three who are newly appointed? Well, let's peel back another layer of the onion, if you will. 
one of those judges who was uh, appointed by Governor Kelly in 2020 is uh, a woman by the name of Melissa Taylor Standridge. She's actually a very good friend of mine. We go back a couple of decades. Um, she came, she was appointed to the Kansas Supreme Court from the Kansas Court of Appeals. She was on the Kansas Court of Appeals. Now, every case, like I said, starts at the trial court level. If the loser doesn't like it, they appeal to the Kansas Court of Appeals, then appeal to the state Supreme Court. So that Hody's decision, it started at the trial court level, just like every case does. Loser at the trial court level gets to appeal. That case was appealed to the Kansas Supreme, I'm sorry, the Kansas Court of Appeals. Melissa Taylor Standridge was part of the Kansas Court of Appeals who decided the underlying, right? And then it went up to the Kansas Supreme Court. I, I hope this is making sense. So at the Kansas Court of Appeals level, that Hody's decision, the court, it was a pretty divided court, but the court decided that a woman has a constitutional right to an abortion. That's what was affirmed up at the appellate court level. Melissa Taylor Standridge joined the opinion, finding that a woman has a constitutional right to access to abortion. So she is pro-choice and we know that because of how she voted in the Hodes case when she was a Kansas Court of Appeals judge. Um, four of the Kansas Court of Appeals judges who are up for retention dissented in that underlying Kansas Court of Appeals decision, meaning they all said a woman does not have a right to access abortion care. So four of the seven Kansas Court of Appeals justices are uh, uh, anti-abortion, um, uh, yeah, anti-abortion. So I'm not gonna tell you the name, I don't, nobody, <laughs> I know it's a lot of numbers, but so you asked, right? Um, so does that help? Does that kind of break it down? So six Kansas Supreme Court justices up for retention. Three of them had a, a decision in that Hodes case at the Kansas Supreme Court level. One dissented, two found a woman had a right to, to an abortion. Um, and uh, at the Kansas Court of Appeals level, seven justices up for retention, uh, four of them who in that opinion at the Kansas Court of Appeals level said a woman does not have a state constitutional right to access abortion care. What, of the Kansas Court of Appeals judges? I, I have it on my computer. I, I don't, I, I, I've, I've got the list. <laughs> I've got the list, um, but I don't, I just don't have their, which of the seven committed to memory. I think green is one. I just, I don't have them committed to memory. But I'll tell you what, here's, here's the crazy thing. I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor. Do you know how long it took me to figure all this stuff out? I mean, I, I created my own little spreadsheet and that's, you know, but, but I mean, it took me like a couple of days of kind of going back to it and who did what opinion and who, and, 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 and then the Hodes Kansas Supreme Court decision to make matters even complicated. The actual decision was what we call a per curiam opinion, meaning the judges agree, but they're not going to sign their name. So you can't even find out who signed the dang opinions. I'm telling you, it took me a while to figure this stuff out. Um, and if it takes me a while, I can only imagine, you know, anybody who, who doesn't, you know, go around the circuit doing speaking tours on constitutional amendments and judges retention of judges so it's it's complicated it's i don't want to say it's complicated it's just hard to find the information and get it all and put it all in a simple fashion you'd think that would be part of the freedom of information act that you should be able to find that out find what? who which oh. vote which judge voted for but i had another comment pertaining to your question, I moved here from Arizona. So when we vote for judges, <clears throat> it's either through the um, League of Women Voters or the, is it a League of Conservation of Women, or no, not of women, just Conservation League of Voters or something like that. They have a whole list of all the judges and how they're ranked by that group. So it doesn't say who voted for what, but it will, there were five, I think, five areas. Knowledge of the law, fairness of the judge, voted by other judges. That's by other attorneys, I believe. But they're the ones who vote on them. 
And so <clears throat> in the 30 that I had to vote for in 2016, I think there were two that I said no go um, because knowledge of the law was like a zero. <laughs> and I thought, well, if you don't know the law, you don't right. deserve to be right. here. <laughs> yeah, well, th yeah, thank you for uh, sharing that with, with us. Um, one place that I haven't dug in deep that um, might have information like that or is a group called Kansans for Care Fair, Fair Courts. Um, again, I haven't I haven't dug into that group, but that might be another potential resource. They might have some information on the judges up for retention. Yeah. Ballotpedia does have a ranking for judges. I looked at the Supreme Court judges. I do not know about the appellate court judges. By ranking, I mean they will say who appointed them, and they will say whether they're leaning Democrat or, or um, Republican. Ballotpedia. Yeah, like like Wikipedia or yeah, yeah. We have a yeah. I'm coming over here. Okay. Hey, thank you, Amy. Um, so there's a minor point. When the governor appoints a judge to the Supreme Court or one of the there are several courts of appeal, or they would okay, okay, okay. So, doesn't the legislature have some kind of approval or knock them off for okay? And what you're thinking of is probably what you're you're saying. Well, in the federal system, right, our senators get to ask questions. In our federal system, right, the president nominates, and by our constitution, again, separation of powers, checks and balances, right. In order for a federal judge then to be appointed, that 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 potential judge has to be confirmed by the Senate, right? So the judge sits down, the Senate asks questions, and there is nothing like that in the state in our Kansas state court system. And again. And this is not like novel. Many, many, many states do it this way in their state court system. So I'm not suggesting that we're some crazy, you know, rogue state doing crazy things, right? It's it's it, it's a very uh, common way state judges are are selected. Kansans for fair courts. Who gets to? Oh. Uh, so we're I'm, I'm going back to my question about uh, if the con if uh, the amendment for the sheriff's amendment, if that passes, and then the attorney general gets to make the call, then he then it goes to a judge. Who picks the judge? And how many judges are available to pick from? Well, um, it depends on what county, how judges are assigned. Counties, it can, you know, often, usually the way courts work is you've got your list of judges, case filed, who's the next judge up? Who's the, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you can't, like, you're not supposed to be able to go judge shopping and try to choose your, your judge. Right. But, but you have to stay within, you know, your county, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I believe that when Governor Brownback was in office, he changed the uh, Court of Appeals process a bit. It had been both the same for the uh, justices and the appellate court, but because the appellate court's not in the Constitution, Governor Brownback changed it. <clears throat> and so the Senate does confirm the appellate court judges right now. Really? Really? I knew as soon as Seal raised her hand, I was going to get corrected on something. She knows everything. Seriously, I thought I, it was my understanding that there's a nomination committee and then they put the, the, the judges names for. Okay, well, okay. If Seal says it, it's true. Um, and I, I'll do some my own research and make sure that um, uh, that when I'm speaking to folks that I get that answer correctly. So Oh, sorry. So, so she said that uh, the the rule on the appointment of judges changed under Brownback, and now the Senate does confirm the governor's suggested appointment. I've never heard that. I can't believe. Oh, just maybe that's okay. Thank you. See, that's why I have y'all here, right? Keep me honest. 
Okay, now I get it sealed. Now I get it. Okay, because the, okay, that makes sense now. I mean, kind of makes sense, but. The supporters of the sheriff election bill, why do they say it's better to put the removal process in the hands of the AG instead of the DA? Like what justification do the supporters provide to make that change? Well, um, I think one of the arguments is that, um, that is, it, is it fair, if you will, for the district attorney to have power to initiate an investigation of a sheriff, and the sheriff doesn't have that same power vis-a-vis -vis the district attorney. So I think that's kind of, you know, one of, one of, one of the arguments that I've heard. Why wouldn't why why wouldn't he why wouldn't he what what a sheriff as our sheriff has said has a right to investigate anything that's against a statute and a law so if a district attorney is suspected of breaking the law then doesn't the sheriff have the right to investigate the district attorney I think we're talking about breaking a law right or engaging in some kind of misconduct that might not be criminal, okay? Um, and, and so currently there is no provision that a sheriff can initiate an investigation into a district attorney. It's just, and, and this is by Kansas law. So these are laws that our legislature has passed um, and, and the current law says district attorneys and the attorney general can initiate this investigation and this amendment would repeal that law and give that power to the attorney general only. Do you have any idea how many times a district attorney has initiated an investigation into a sheriff, not for breaking a law, but for some other type of misconduct that's not a, lo a broken law? I don't have any stats on that. And, and, and honestly, like this hasn't come up very often, okay? But, but I mean, it's things like this, if you're not paying attention two years down the road, you got some, something you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about the fact that, that such a, a rare thing could happen uh, and we're changing the proceedings. So I, I yeah, right. So um, it, it's, it's not like this is now, the, 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 the executive agency and the, the veto power thing, that's gonna come up a lot if this if this amendment passes. That's that's that we're gonna we're gonna hear and see uh, what the legislature is doing. If the sheriff's amendment passes, uh, we probably I mean, unless, you know, it just doesn't happen that often, but we have to we have to go in educated and informed as to what we want the process to be if somebody, if our elected sheriff is doing something bad actually who does anybody let me get somebody who has it oh do you have do you have him yes right oh yeah okay so these are so this is yeah green well but now some of these aren't up for retention so i'd have to cross reference my list uh green hill bruns powell powell schroeder and gardner i know that it is the four who who um, are anti-choice on the Kansas Court of Appeals are Green, Hill, Schroeder, and Gardner. I do know that after seeing the names. Thank you very much. You thought about going to law school? How are we doing? Should we, are we? Okay. Okay, so the question uh, from Zoom. So the election of a sheriff doesn't negate the ability to consolidate county city governments, right? That's just that if the county city governments consolidate, then the sheriff would still have to be elected. We could still consolidate county and city governments, right? Yes, we can, we can. We can consolidate uh, our city and county governments. Uh, the amendment would just say, but, in addition to a police director, you have to have an elected county sheriff.
so if we go toward the if we say yes for the if we say yes for the sheriff does the state attorney general have the ability to initiate their own cases sure if if we go forward with yes and the sheriff the constitution question goes yes for the sheriff then does the state attorney general have the ability to initiate their own cases at their own will pick a, pick a county pick, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Well, um, I mean, you know, I honestly. So, so the concern is that the attorney general can just go pick who who they, you know, what sheriffs they want investigated, um, and so that could be a potential abuse of power. The other potential thing consequence, if the amendment passes, is that. Um, like I suggested, oftentimes it's the local DAs who know when the sheriffs are doing something wrong. So if you have a local district attorney who believes that a sheriff has, you know, hid evidence or what, whatever, under the amendment, they don't have the power to do anything. What do they have to do? They have to call the attorney general in Topeka and say, hey, will you please initiate an investigation? Where does the power rest with the attorney general? Right, the attorney general can say no, thank you, I like that sheriff, or can say yes, let's go ahead and initiate an investigation. So, yeah, it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, Correct. They're not ready yet. It's my understanding. I think Jamie's office is, 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 that, is that your understanding? I don't think they're ready yet, um, but it is a really good idea. What is the website? Is there in, in there just a website sealed? On Ballotpedia? It will have a, okay, yeah. Because it's so much better when you can actually see it ahead of time, right? Well, you know, I might just do a pesky letter to the editor on that one. <laughs> Question? Oh, what's the, what, you, what are you holding up here? Oh, there is a list of candidates at the table, if you didn't grab one, um, on your way out. Okay. Well, but it does isn't turn on Zoom. <laughs> the uh, surest way to find your sample ballot is give Jamie a little bit of time and go to our uh, Douglas County uh, election office. You, there's other sources. You can go to vo vote 411. It may not have everything there, but if you want to see your sample ballot, type in your address on the Douglas County website. Thank you. All right. I don't see any more hand. Oh, I do see a hand. Hold on. About the legislative veto amendment, what's the chance of or mechanism to challenge that on the basis that the federal constitution guarantees each state a Republican form of government? And if this violates separation of powers principles so baldly, how might that happen? Well, I've actually written on that. Um, and um, Believe it or not, and if you were in class, I would tell you to put your pencils down because I'm not going to test over this. Um, so um, several years back, this came up, whether uh, the legislature could pass laws that affected executive agencies by a simple majority. The Kansas State Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. It violates separation of powers. And so this very thing uh, has already been determined by the Kansas Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. When I discovered that case, I reached out to a couple of my attorney friends who are way smarter than I am, um, and I said, what is the deal? Like, how, how, 
how do we challenge this? I think the, the I think I have issues with the constitutionality of it just at its base level, and so has the Supreme Court in the past. And so my very smart uh, attorney friend, um, who does a, who, who who's active in the space and lawyering, emailed me back and he said, "We'll bring a case," meaning if it passes and something happens, uh, and and you know no matter which way you think on it, uh, but there could be a legal challenge to the constitutionality of the constitutional amendment itself. It's crazy, I know. Aren't you glad you put your pencils down, right? So, thank you. But in the meantime, how many regulations could they destroy? while they're waiting for that to go through the, to the Supreme Court or wherever the heck it has to go? Well, there is no limit on the number of regulations that they can revoke or rescind. So they could have a party, a, a revocation party, if you will, right? Um, and, and there wouldn't really be anything to do about it in the meantime unless it's properly challenged. No, I just have a question because I'm looking at the ballot for the appellate court, and um, it says one of the candidate or one of the appellate judges had retired this summer, uh, Tony Powell. And so I'm curious, like, who did, did, was somebody appointed to replace him, and therefore we don't know that person's record much. I know that Melissa Taylor Standridge is the last. I think she was the last one appointed. So. Um, Sorry, sorry, I'm getting to meet, I get, um, I don't know. I don't know if that, I don't know the status of that. That'll be one of my things I'll um, check out. Thank you. I can understand the First Amendment, like a power grab by the legislature and how that could have come, but the one with the sheriff seems very odd. Like, why in the world did this arrive? Was someone mad at a DA or? <laughs> I, I, I think it's more, it, it's more the election of sheriffs and um, the sort of throw in the provision that only the district, uh, only the uh, attorney general can initiate an investigation. I mean, I don't know, maybe it was purposeful, maybe it was an afterthought, but it's my understanding that the thrux of the amendment was to make sure that uh, we, that our sheriffs, the head law enforcement in our county are elected. They, they vote or they, you know, they answer to the people. So it's my understanding that was, that's sort of the reasoning but the thing, it already happens, you're right, but if a, if a county and city government consolidate, then they don't have to have an elected as their highest law enforcement official. This is really not for Zoom, but uh, I want to congratulate Douglas County on their voter participation on the Constitutional Amendment for the abortion. So, right on. Douglas County. All right. Well, I don't see any more hands. Um, thank you all for uh, coming tonight. Uh, Y'all are my first presentation on this. First time I whipped out these PowerPoint slides. So hopefully, 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 uh, I, you walk away feeling a little bit more informed about the November election. Thank you. We did have a question. Um, if they could get the PDF of your PowerPoint. Um. If anybody would like a PDF of the PowerPoint that I created, what's the easiest? Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you know me, you can email me. If not, yeah, you can you can email me. I'm Melissa Fisher Isaacs. My email is mfisherisaacs at lplks.org. Thanks, everybody.